let, let that stop us. Here we go. Okay. All right. And we are live. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, well, here's JT. All right. Um, going to let in JT Ellison. This is Patrick Milliken from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona. And we're here with another of our virtual events. And uh, it's a real treat to have uh, Isabel Cañas here with us this evening, talking about her new book, The Hacienda. And uh, let's see who else is on the screen. Our good friends, uh, Jane Ann Krentz and JT Ellison. And of course, Barbara Peters back from her trip uh, from her home office. And uh, you'll be delighted to know that I'm gonna go into the background. And, uh, but I will be monitoring the comments field. So if you have questions for uh, Isabel, or our other authors tonight, go ahead and put them in. And Barbara will summon me back on screen in about, what, 45 minutes or something like that. So uh, over to you, Barbara. Thank you very much, Patrick. I'm really excited about this. For one thing, Jane Ann and JT and I have done a whole series of sort of symposia, I think we could call it, on the Gothic. And now, Isabel, with you, we actually have a captive author, yay, to talk about it. In point of fact, JT wrote a very good Gothic um, earlier, which we, um, which might have actually inspired this whole thing. Do you think it did, JT? Absolutely. I am, I am definitely the inspiration for everybody's Gothic. <laughs> right. So, Shades of Rebecca. Um, but I like <laughs> yep, Isabel's sure. work has been described by some as messy. Mexican Gothic meets Rebecca, and in many ways, that's true. Um, this is our May 1st mystery book of the month. We're nearly sold out, uh, but we do still have a few signed copies left, and we probably could persuade Isabel to sign more if we really absolutely had to, couldn't we, Isabel? I'm sure you could. I would be honored, in fact. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and the book has been wonderfully well received, um, but I thought we might talk for a moment, ladies, about how Isabel... Um, came to write it because she said before the Hacienda, this I'm quoting an interview that she did, uh, I primarily wrote short stories and fantasy. And for me, the driving energy and fantasy as a genre is wonder. So let me stop right there and ask you two ladies, do you agree with that? <laughs> Who are you asking? I'm asking you, I'm looking Hacienda. at you, Jay. <laughs> I think that that describes it. I usually use the word curiosity, but I think I think that goes perfectly well with wonder. I think it's changeable for me. And JT, you're writing under a different name. You're you've ventured off into that genre with a for the librarian a CIA agent, one of my favorite concepts. So what do you think? I, I agree. I think wonder is exactly what drives the magic and, and the gothic has to have that little bit of element of that to, to work, right? We have to be able to be, is this, could this happen? Is this really happening? I mean, that's part of that sleight of hand, you know, fantasy for sure. That's exactly where it comes from. I think, I think Isabel's done a beautiful job of it with this as well. I do too. Really but here's, where she, here's where she goes on. And this is the part I think is fabulous. The Hacienda is my first novel length foray into horror. So it forced me to evaluate my craft in unexpected ways. Horror is a genre of tension and suspense of atmosphere and feeling. I had to teach myself a lot about how to precisely wield tone and voice. I worked hard to imbue my setting with feeling and to better control with pacing. I think all writers should try their hand at horror. It really demands that the writer inspire deep feeling in the reader. That is such a wonderful discussion, Isabel. Bravo. Thank you so much. I was just thinking like, wow, I, I wrote that? <laughs> <laughs> you did, although you do say in the book that the whole inspiration began because you're afraid of the dark, but I thought we'd, I thought we'd do something more elegant. But Jane, tell us a little bit about your conversation with John Charles for your own wonderful book as Amanda Quick that you did last week and about what John and you talked about regarding horror. John Charles, Isabel, is a bookseller at the pen. If you haven't run into it, that's that's, and he's a former librarian, and he really is one of the. Barbara and I agree. He has is one of those people who just has insights into what makes things work in books, why readers go after them, and his comment on horror is that first of all, it's the genre nobody admits to reading. It, it's it's you never say, oh, I love horror. Maybe you would if you were, you know, but only Stephen King, you know, something. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just kind of got a bad rap. But 
he says people love it when it's infused into another kind, another look, another look, if you will. Mm. And the Gothic is the perfect version of that. So, yeah, because I love like it, it melds different genres. So you've got kind of a history, like for my book, for example, you have a his the, ho- the horror, which like you said, nobody wants to admit to reading horror. Also, no one wants to really, uh, there are a lot of people in the mainstream general reading audience who don't want to buy horror necessarily because they think, oh, that's not for me or, oh, I'm not that hardcore or, oh, I don't do scary books or scary movies. But if the way um, the Gothic works is that it like kind of folds or the way that I chose to do it in my Gothic is that I folded it into sneakily into two genres that are a little more mainstream like historical fiction and some elements of thriller and so I kind of yeah, I tricked readers into accepting <laughs> horror into their lives and into their you know reading worlds. I, th- I think that's kind really of cool. what John was getting at it was just if it's if it's properly or if it's so carefully presented people I heard someone once say, and I would love to quote exactly who it was. It might have been Ellen Datlow, who's a, a very famous editor of short fiction that is horror, um, that I, I could be totally wrong. But I heard that horror is not so much a genre, but a kind of tone. Mm-hmm. So that you can, it's one of those things that you can lay almost like like a filter on Instagram over another genre. You can have sci-fi that is horror. You can have fantasy that is horror. You can have historical fiction that leans into horror. So in that way, it's extremely versatile. And so it really changes, it, it, it just changes so much depending on what you decide to write. But it has some principles that, as Barbara <laughs> read, I have said that I believe horror really de- derives a lot of its power from atmosphere and that requires um, on a nitpicky craft level that I love getting nerdy about, but I don't know if we wanna bore everyone with that tonight. On a nitpicky craft level, it really requires precision of voice and of pacing to really make it work. Because like when you watch a horror movie, there's lighting, there's jump scares, there's music. And with a book, it's just words on a page. And so it really, I think, I think, uh, I believe very strongly that it forced me to level up when I decided to write this genre, which was honestly kind of a whim. (laughs) I decided to do it as like a screw you because I'd gotten a very heartbreaking rejection on a manuscript that had gone through the zone submission that had to revise and resubmit, you know, the story. It was another rejection, another rejection, another rejection. I was on my honeymoon in Mexico City, actually, where I lived as a kid with my husband when I got this final rejection. And I just started like crying in public. And, um, you know, he was consoling me. He said, well, what are you going to work on next? You know, let's get back in the saddle. And I had this, this seed of a haunted house idea, because as Barbara mentioned, like this story came about because I'm very afraid of like dark, creaky houses and things that go bump in the night. <laughs> um, I have completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> yeah. What, what do you think is the appeal of the Gothic horror? Because that's always the big house. It's, it, I think houses are something that are omnipresent in our lives, aren't they? Houses shelter us. They're places that we go to relax on vacation. They're places that we spend the vast majority of our lives in. And I wrote this book, the, I wrote the majority of this book at the, in the very early stages of lockdown in April, 2020. And so the thing on everybody's minds was how we were all in houses and we've all became very well acquainted with our dwellings. And I moved quite a lot when I was a kid. I think my, God, I've lost track, but we moved like every four years up until I went to university. And then in university, when you're a student, you move every single year. And I realized when I was about five years old, I'd moved in, we'd moved into a house in, in the Northern suburbs of Chicago, my family and I, that had the creepiest freaking basement that I had ever seen in my, you know, brief but wondrous five years of life. And when I was naughty, which I often was as a five-year-old, I got put in timeout at the bottom of the basement stairs. Oh, Oh, that's cruel. (laughs) I had, you know, ample time to meditate on what makes a house scary down there. And I think that was for me like a very I don't know. 
And so I think houses, you know, on, in the book, Andres says, I have a theory about houses. I'm like, I have lots of theories about houses, but I think some listeners, and maybe you guys will agree that not all houses feel the same. Some places are places of refuge and you can feel it the moment you walk through the door, you're more at peace. Other places have vibes, you know? I've walked into houses, like I remember, um, <laughs> I remember walking to, um, the home of the mother of my ex-boyfriend and just being like stunned at like how tense the whole house was. And perhaps it had something to do with their relationship because it was very acrimonious, but like something to do with the people in the spaces and the energy to me has always been fascinating. And something that when it goes wrong is really interesting to me because it's scary. <laughs> <laughs> JT, you ought to address that because one of the things that you love to do is, in fact, to take pictures of interesting spaces. I do. I do. I, you know, I've never, I love how you've just explained that because that is a very succinct way of pulling all the things I think about with houses out of my brain and saying it in a way that I actually have never thought of before because I write stories about, you know, what's, what happens when the door closes, right? Yeah. What, what's happening on the, on the inside. And that is, I'm, I'm kind of fascinated. I'm going to go back and listen to you talk about this again when we listen to this, because that's really cool. I'm, <clears throat> you know, I am fascinated with, again, how we work in our own spaces, right? And I love libraries. I love pictures of desks. I, I like how I, some of the fit, my favorite things are authors' offices, Right. I, I would love to do a coffee table book of authors' offices because I think it just is so incredibly interesting to see how we surround ourselves with our creativity. Is it completely austere? Is it is it very colorful? Is you know what what really works for us? But I do. I love to take those pictures and they're props for me. I mean, I use a lot of those as story prompts. Oh, that's so like that's somebody's, that's somebody's office. That's somebody's house. You know, when I'm, when I'm building a story, man, I live on Zillow <laughs> and I'm always love looking that. for the house for the right. I, love that. I used Google earth. Cause it, cause I was writing this book during the pandemic. I couldn't go back to Mexico to visit, you know, mm -hmm. I've been to this area briefly, like driven through it, uh, parts of it on um, like day trips to Teotihuacan, which is an archeological site outside of Mexico city, but I've never been like properly at this site. And as a, I just finished my PhD in history. So as a historian, I find this, I find like going to the place and like experiencing like the primary cool. documents, so to speak, like I would have loved to do that but I couldn't because of the pandemic. So I just kind of like lurked on Google earth. Like where are the mountains? What kind of like, historical houses still exist in this area? You know, what kind of um, spaces were those like? And so for me, when I built this house in my head, it was like a, like a collage of several different houses I lived in when I was a kid. So I have like a catalog to pick from when I'm writing a book. And when I have characters move through spaces, I'm like, oh yeah, the house I lived in when I was 13, that's gonna be the ground floor. Ah, yes, the kitchen, that's gonna be from the house I lived in when I was, when I was 10 or, or what have you. But one thing that was super influential for me was I lived in Southern California uh, for a while when I was a kid. And I uh, lived near the Mission Basilica San Juan Capistrano. So the mission architecture, the stucco, and I lived in Mexico City as a kid, like this sort of thing, like that sort of um, aesthetic and the way that sound moves through space in those kinds of buildings was something that for me, I really wanted to get on the page. Like the echoes of your footsteps in a church, the way that the air tastes when you walk into a sacristy, which is like very dusty and full of like, you know, stored things from a church that priests might use like twice a year for feast days. So I don't know, spaces, oh, I get so nerdy about the spaces in my books. <laughs> but, but it works. It I mean, it works. Like a good company too. <laughs> well, <laughs> I love it. JT, you should, you should, this is a perfect time for you to recite our, the three rules of gothics that the, uh, Barbara and you and I came up with in Excuse our last. Me, because I was waiting to see, see if Isabel agrees. 
<laughs> so, so uh, now you, you gotta, you gotta bear with me. I literally just got off a plane. So I'm, I'm still got like high altitude brain, but there has to be a house. There has to be an ingenue who is, you know, coming to the house, whether she is, you know, uh, a, a, a child or a new bride. And there has to be, what's the third Jane madness, madness, madness. Ma- <laughs> Or, or, I'm which, avoiding right now, <laughs> which I think is the horror element. That's well. Am I, all, am I, let me am just throw like all. Too. Sorry, but let me let me just throw something out because horror, you know, there's a sort of sprawling or inchoate sort of thing about horror. I think the house acts as a way to focus it. You know, I mean, in the it's sort of like a Christie country house design, but I think I think you have to contain. The horror, whatever it is, in a in a recognizable space. Otherwise, you know, if you were just in like some ninety five acre cemetery or something, you couldn't really focus the action enough. Well, and you you're doing that here, San Isidro. Am I saying that right? Yeah, you are. Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> um, the the Northern Wing, you know, in Rebecca, it's the same thing. There's there is that containment of don't go there. Right. If you go there, bad things will happen. And that's the tension of the story right there. And, and to our point, it was all about making the threat from within. Right. Not, not the Correct. attacking military or something like that, but the, but the threat is always intimate. Yeah, yeah. well, the house contains it, right, which is sort of the point. Now, Isabel- in I, her- I like that, Barbara. I like that um, idea. I yeah. like that idea of the containment. That's well, because I, you could do I that in a room. You have to, with, with, if you have- as I say, that kind of sprawling or inchoate menace that's so crucial to the Gothic, you have to have some way, you know, to contain it. Otherwise, if you just have a malevolent presence or something that's floating all over, what good would it do? <laughs> so, but Isabel goes on to say, and let's talk because we've talked about these other things. She says, I reached for familiar archetypes, the young wife, i.e., you just mentioned it, the naive character. The distant husband, because in part, you know, he's part of the menace, or he might be. The secretive family member, or in Rebecca, it's the housekeeper, but, you know, still all works out. The untrustworthy servants. And this part I love about Isabel. I knew I wanted an exorcism, so I threw in a priest for good (laughs) measure. Well done, Isabel, because the witchy priest um, is really such a great part of this book. Well, thank you so much. He really wasn't meant to play a large role in this book at all. Like when I started planning it, I thought I want an exorcism. I want there to be a priest. I want him to be someone on whom Beatrice can rely. And also because he was authentic to the setting. If you were a young woman in very Catholic 19th century Mexico and you suspected your house uh, had a bad case of um, the hauntings, (laughs) <laughs> and you thought that the solution was spiritual, then you would seek out a priest because growing up in an extremely conservative Catholic household, I'm like, well, duh, <laughs> that's of course, that's the natural progression of decisions that this person would make. Um, but this character walked in and absolutely threw my plan for this book unceremoniously out the window. He was not meant to be a witch at all. I was writing a scene early on um, where he first comes to the the character for for those who are listening who haven't read the book is named uh, Padre Andres Villalobos. And he comes to San Isidro to suss the place out. You know, Beatriz has asked him for help. Uh, He's agreed to help her. And he says that he needs to understand what's plaguing the house. And so he needs to see it as she would at night. Um, It's not a pleasant experience. And after going to the North Wing and quickly retreating to, you know, a more or less safe part of the house, I was watching the scene in my head as I wrote it because I'm a very visual writer. So I was just typing away, watching it like a movie. And he walked into the room, he pulled a piece of charcoal from his pocket and he crouched on the ground and he began to write. And I lifted my hands off the keyboard in surprise because I heard a voice in my head like, as clearly as if somebody had been speaking to me saying he is a witch. And I had not planned that. (laughs) And I immediately knew like, I am someone who am, I am superstitious, but I'm not superstitious about the way I write books. I have a plan. 
I have many outlines. I have right out of the screen, an entire shelf of craft books. You know, I'm very methodical and measured and, you know, full of spreadsheets in my approach. And he was like, Padre Andres walked into this book and was like, no, start again. <laughs> and so I had to completely rehaul my plan for this book because once I, once I heard that voice and once I knew he was a witch, I was like, there's no going back to the original idea. And so the whole book, like the whole spine of the book um, became his character arc and his um, way of reconciling two sides of himself, two sides of himself, both spiritually and in terms of his magic, but also in terms of his role as a, a priest and a leader in his community. He's mm -hmm. also mestizo, which in this, which means to be of mixed heritage, specifically for him to have a father who was from Spain of European white heritage and a mother who was indigenous. And at that time in this historical period, again, putting on my historian's cap, um, being mestizo or being of mixed descent, whether that was indigenous, mixed indigenous white or mixed indigenous white and black, any combination of those meant that your position in, in society could be quite precarious. And it wasn't impossible to move up as Beatrice tried, but it was very, very difficult. And often your legal status was tied to your racial makeup. So it was a really messed up system, but I really wanted um, that to be reflected in his magic. And he just completely became the soul of this book in a way that I never expected because he lives an experience that I lived a conflict that I lived of having parents from different cultural backgrounds, being raised in a faith that is very demanding and does not have a lot of give or have a lot of love and trying to grapple with questions of belonging and identity and faith from a very young age. So I adore him and I'm so, so happy that he's been resonating with readers because he's not just like I mean, he's a hunk. Like the first thing my aunt did when she read this book is text me like, wow, okay. <laughs> like, yes, of course I made him a hunk because I am a deeply self-indulgent woman before all else. Um, but I also wanted him to speak uh, as a form of wish fulfillment because growing up, I also didn't see a lot of leaders in the church who were compassionate or who listened to women. And so I really... Uh, this is like maybe some healing for myself <laughs> to write him in such a way. You know, he's a man like the men in my family who are surrounded by women um, and who treat them with compassion and listen to them and try to act in a way that is good for the best of the larger community and not just for themselves. And so Padre Andres ends up making sacrifices, uh, which is very sad. <laughs> which raises a question for me. I, yeah. I just... Do you think this book would have worked the way you wanted it to work if you'd set it in the modern era? Did it take the historical setting to pull it off? I think the historical setting allows you to have creative um, confines, if you were constraints, creative constraints um, and premises that I don't necessarily think would fly in the modern era. So for example, Beatrice, cannot provide for her and her mother after her father dies. She's dependent on relatives. So I guess you can make, and so she marries for money. And I think you could spin that into the modern world. I think that's, you could definitely, you know, maybe she, um, there's something in her backstory that means she can only work, you know, an hourly wage job. And of course in America, that is not a living wage. And so she's reliant on relatives and decides to marry up and ends up in this beautiful estate. You know, it, you could kind of follow it. I think the, her instinct to go to the church for help is perhaps not entirely modern to a mainstream audience, but I think to me coming up in a very conservative and Catholic, very Opus Dei Catholic environment, perhaps, perhaps a logical decision, perhaps it could work. But I find myself drawn to, um, I don't write contemporary stories. I've never written anything set in the modern era. I find that writing for me has always been a form of escapism. And so for me, what for me, that means a different place. I want to travel, I want to go somewhere else. I want to be somewhere else. I want to be living in someone else's shoes in a world that is so unlike my own that I don't have to think about, 
you know, just or broadly at anything political that's happened in the last two, three, five years. So I don't think I would have written it in the modern era, but I think it could be spun that way. Now that I think about it, that's very insightful. Might be a fun bookend. It is, it, there is the modern Gothic, there is a level of dissonance because the, the ingenue can escape a lot yeah. more easily, you know, in the, in the historical, even in the thirties, you know, even in the, in the Rebecca era, the, anything before the fifties, I think women were much more um, forced to be where they were with their families, with their, their spouses, you know, with whatever the world has set up for them now, you know, something is bad. And, and if you have the means you can get out of it. Yeah, I think maybe a key part of that ingenue archetype is the fact that she lacks agency or he lacks agency. Exactly. Yes. Absolutely. 100%. In Rebecca, you see that I think um, when I was, before I wrote this book, I reread The Haunting of Hill House twice in a row. One, Shirley Jackson's mastery of voice is insane. Like talk about a lesson in first pages, just wall to wall bonkers. Um, But I... I don't remember the main character's name. It might be Eleanor or something, but the main character absolutely has this, I think it's set in the 1950s and she doesn't have a car. She has to ask somebody to drive her to to Hill House for the like grand social experiment that living in this purportedly haunted haunted house would be. Um, And I think, and she doesn't really have like, she has the trappings of a modern life But when you're in her point of view and you're deeply embedded in how she views the world, you have an incredible claustrophobic sense of how much agency she lacks. And kind of going to this house is like, it's incredibly risky behavior that's really gonna shake up her life. And her sister thinks, or I think her sister-in-law, I don't remember, thinks she's crazy, Um, but she does it. And I think that close point of view where you're deeply embedded in the main character, the ingenue's head can be very claustrophobic and really contribute to atmosphere. I felt that when I was reading Rebecca and it made me want to like, I was like, girl, fight back, say something, you know, it was maddening, but it's very powerful writing. Mm-hmm. Well, it is, but I think that one of the one of the reasons Rebecca doesn't entirely work is the comparison is because Beatrice does have agency. She I is content, you know, with, um, I mean, in a way, it's sort of a coming of age story for her. Um, but I like the way that, you know, she, she decides not to just sit there um, and let it all happen, but pause her way back. And also when you introduce Father I Amy, mean, there's a, there's a, a hint of kind of a love story, but I like the way, I really like the way you handled it. What did you think, Jane and JT? Did you like the way that, I mean, it's a very delicate ending, really. Yeah. It's a delicate ending. And the relationship between the two characters is my kind of partnership relationship, which is what I like in my stories. It's the kind of romance I like, even if it's never consummated. I like that sense of, of the bond that builds two people working together to survive. I agree. I agree. Well, and it also highlights a big theme of your book, which is, in fact, uh, colonialism and how toxic, you know, the cast. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know about you guys, but I've read a lot of books set in New Orleans and New Orleans, you know, has actual classifications for race. You know, you have octoroons, quadroons, the whole bit. And you know, very similar to what's going on. Yeah. And, and I have to say, Isabel, I mean, I'm an historian. I mean, I've been an historian for a lot longer than either any of you have. <laughs> I, I knew almost nothing about Mexico in 1820, you know, 22, when, when the war for independence is over. It was a real eye opener for me. Did you both react that way? It, it's, it's a period of history I knew nothing about. Well, then that's the, that's what you were talking, Isabel, about that you feel like you leveled up. And I think that is how you level up. You take a moment in time that people aren't as familiar with and you marry, you you cross pollinate some of the genres and then you've created something completely new. And we can say Mexican Gothic meets Rebecca, but this is different. Yeah, that's, that's that's what I was saying going in. I said, it feels new. 
It, it feels fresh. It feels the elements new. are there, but it's uh-huh. new. And that's part of that is the setting. Part of that is the time frame. Part of that is the cross pollination of the genres. But but you've also got a voice that I mean I was highlighting. I'm just like wow, girl. I mean it's a heck of a heck of a debut. Thank you very much. I think Clearly it's, it's not your first time writing. I think it's, I wrote uh, I wrote several books. I started writing when I was seriously when I was. I wrote a ton when I was a kid, stopped in college, um, really picked it back up again after I finished college and wrote my first novel in the first year of my PhD, which was in 2015, 2016. And every year of my PhD, I wrote another novel. And some people think that I'm crazy for balancing those two things, but I think the writing, because it was a form of escapism, kept me sane. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So I got my agent in 2017, tried and failed with two manuscripts on submission, and I wrote a lot of short stories. I went to an incredible uh, short story writing workshop called the Clarion West Writers Workshop, where I studied with some brilliant short fiction writers who just blow me out, blew me out of the water, like really taught me a lot about economy of language and not just language for the sake of beautiful language for the sake of being beautiful, but directed beautiful language. Like if you're using, if you're describing something in a room, it must be contributing to tone, to atmosphere, sometimes even to plot, to characterization because it's through someone's point of view. So I always thought that I had a distinct writerly voice and I was always told in school like, oh, you're a good writer. Uh, But I think writing short fiction really taught me how to wield that tool in a more precise way. And I am so grateful (laughs) for those six weeks that they kicked my butt in workshop because I can really, I really see it um, coming through like different layers of revision. I usually write really clean first drafts, but when I, um, do I have the manuscript? No, I used to have my old first draft of or second draft of of this book hanging out in my office, but um, I did several passes where I would highlight in different colors, the manuscript like purple was for this needs to be more vivid or yellow meant like this is an opportunity for more precise characterization. And like green was something else like setting and red was something, pink was something else. And so I just kind of went through the entire manuscript and then went back to the beginning of the document and went through line by line with a fine tooth comb. And it was excruciating, <laughs> but it really taught me so much. How long that did it take you to write your it? notes from Clarion? Oh, I love my notes <laughs> from Clarion. I would share them, but they're impossible scrolls. I actually wrote this book fairly quickly. I, speaking of escapism, I did not, I was at a point in my PhD where I was meant to be work, writing my dissertation and I did not want to because COVID was coming down, the world was coming down around our ears and I was very, very anxious. So I wrote the first three, the first 40,000 words in three weeks in November of 2019, set it aside, went back to university to teach, um, came back to it in April of 2020, finished the manuscript and did a slight revision pass for my agent in two weeks. So all in all, the first draft came together in five weeks, which for me was insane. And then I did subsequent revisions with my agent I think maybe it was mostly like a lot of line editing because the main pieces were there. This book was like a bolt of lightning. I thought after having written this book, I have this whole book writing thing figured out. Good for me. (laughs) Now I'm in the midst of revising my second book for my publisher and oh boy, is it not the case. (laughs) It's a different piece entirely. But I think I feel um, really happy that this book is not just my debut, but it's a book that came to me and unspooled so easily and with like little witchy moments of its own, like Andreas revealing himself to be a witch, what I was completely unaware of or how the idea, the first pages actually came to me. Um, I tell this story a lot, so I hope I don't bore listeners, but when I was on holiday on my honeymoon in Mexico City with my husband and I had the terrible rejection, Um, that night I was laying in bed around midnight and it was October. So there was a thunderstorm outside. There was like amazing lightning and thunder, which is something I absolutely love. Um, and I was just kind of 
staring at the ceiling and trying to go to sleep because it was like midnight or one in the morning. And I heard this voice like begin to narrate. And I immediately snatched my phone off the nightstand because I thought, oh my God, this is the beginning of something new. And I wrote it down as fast as my thumbs could handle because I didn't want that voice to slip away. And I kind of like blocked out the whole thing. And those became the first pages of the Hacienda. And I just think like, it's so special that <laughs> this ridiculous book that broke my process, that surprised me time and time again, that came to me after years of rejection, that is not a genre I usually write, that does not have characters I usually write, that deals with Catholicism, that I usually avoid like the plague after my childhood, became my debut. But really, it's the most honest book I've ever written. And I think it did force me to be very vulnerable with myself as a writer, but also about the things that I fear and the things that have hurt me in the past. So I love this book to pieces. I'm so glad that it resonated with you, too, with you, all of you. It really means the world to me. But it's funny, it sounds almost, and, and, and Jane can, can speak to this as well. Sometimes the story and the idea and the characters possess us. And, and it comes out, it just comes out, it shows, it comes out very quickly, it works on all the levels that you need it to work on. And sometimes it's like, you know, clawing fossils from rocks. So when you have those possession books where it actually flows like that, my God, honor that as much as you can. That is the high we chase every time we write a book. For sure. You know, it's kind of a gamble. You are like, you don't, I'm beginning to learn, you know, I'm still, I'm very new at this. I'm beginning to learn that every book, one, of course, every book is different, mm -hmm. but you don't know what kind of different the book is going to be until you're in the trenches. <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. <laughs> That's very <laughs> true. Well, and, and JT and I have often commented that the, um, the thing about creativity is that most of us are at our most creative when we're actually in the act of creating, not beforehand, when it would be very useful to know where exactly where you're going. <laughs> That's I Jane and I help. just had this conversation. Creativity begets creativity. It does. It does. It does. That's why part of my process is getting up in um, early-ish, not extremely early. I know some writers get up at five. I'm like, 10 to seven is pushing it for me guys. And I immediately start writing like as I'm drinking my morning coffee. Cause for me, like I try and remove barriers to the act of creating because I think as a PhD student I've become a bit of an expert in the art of procrastination. And I know the beginning as soon as I can um, and beginning creating, like as soon as my fingers are moving and I'm either free writing or brainstorming about a character then the dialogue starts to come. Then I have an insight about a character's backstory that I didn't have before or a relationship between two characters, a different side of it that I hadn't seen before. But you're totally right. Like the advice that I give um, other writers in my like PhD writing workshop is that like you have to write because that's when the ideas come. And it's absolutely, the, it's absolutely true for fiction as well. You, you gotta do the work in order to get the good ideas, which is frustrating because you're like, well, I'm writing stupid stuff first. <laughs> It's okay. You can, you can fix anything in the mix. <laughs> you cannot fix a blank page, but you can fix anything else in the mix. Amen. <laughs> now, one thing I really liked so much about the book is we've talked about Beatrice and her being an ingenue and, you know, her being a bride and coming to this amazing hacienda, San Ysidro. Um, and, you know, she, she's something of a victim. Her father um, has had a, tragic ending to a brilliant life and left his, her and her mother destitute and dependent on unpleasant relatives. So, you know, as you say, she marries for money to escape it. Um, and she gradually gains agency and decides not to be a victim and all. But what I really also like is the priest because he's kind of in the same position, you mm -hmm. know? I mean, here he comes um, uh, in his, his handicap is that he's mestizo. Um, or, you know, indigenous, really, um, in a church that is not going to value that. And so he's exiled, in a way, to this place, right? I mean, he's not there by choice. 
And so he too has to decide, is he going to just be a victim or is he going to gradually gain agency as we go along? And I love the idea that he's a witch because I mean, you know, 99% of all books about witches, it's always a woman, right? Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, it just is, you know? And so here we have this, this wonderful man. Um, and and I, I love the fact that they, they're kind of on parallel tracks from very different reasons. And, and they form a sort of partnership and help each other. Now that never happens in Rebecca. Mr. Okay. DeWinter, you know, Maxim, and let's remember, she's only Mrs. DeWinter. She never has a name. No, in, she in never gets a name. Right? Right. Um, yeah. And JT, in your wonderful book, I'm sorry, the name is going blank. The Island. Her Dark Lies. Sorry? Her, her Dark Lies. Her Dark Life, right. You know, you create a, something of a Rebecca scenario. So how did you decide to design that book to make it a little bit different? So I had a, a core question. I was listening to, I knew I was writing an homage to Rebecca and I'd always wanted to. And I was listening to it and I, I had forgotten a couple of things. And then I sat there and went, wait a second, she's dead, isn't she? Well, yes, of course she's dead. What are you thinking? Of course she's dead. And I started going, well, wait, what if she wasn't? What if she wasn't dead? What if it was all a ruse? And what if she really was orchestrating all of this, huh? And then, and that's how mine came about because his, his ex-wife, my towering uh, his, his dead wife is not truly dead. And, and it is definitely what happens if Rebecca had lived. I mean, she, she, she made life hell for everybody. And it was, that was so much fun, right? Just twisting that story just enough so it's not a retelling, but it's just a reimagining of what could have been. That's I think it's a very powerful idea. You know, maybe Rebecca really isn't dead. Um, I mean, because, when I was reading know, it for the first time, I was convinced she was going to pop out of the woodwork because she's sure. so alive in, in the house and in the memory yeah. of the Danvers. And just like the ghost of her is so tangible. I love that. Well, maybe she, she really is isn't Danvers dead. Really. If we, if, if, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, well, I mean, if we're going to bring in our third our triad, the madness, maybe the madness is she isn't really dead because she is so present for those who she left behind. She never really dies. I mean, her body may be gone, but her spirit is certainly still there. Maybe well, she passed it on to Mrs. Danvers, Danvers and you do something of the same thing, you know, Isabel, because we haven't mentioned that Don Rodolfo has mm -hmm. a dead wife. Yeah. <laughs> Beatrice is his, is his second wife, and she comes to San Ysidro, and, you know, there's a dead wife, but is it Mr. Rochester and the woman in the attic? Is it Rebecca? And she's really dead. You know, is she somewhere, you know, locked up in the, in the hacienda? And we have one of the sister, we have the housekeeper, and, you know, there's that whole thing all the way through about how powerful is the presence of um a person not actually in, you know, alive in the story, or we don't think that person is alive in the story. I got a question because yeah. you're more versed in, in the genre than I am. Is it always a female presence that haunts the houses in these stories? No, I haven't gone back and read the fall of the house of Usher in forever or the, the original the original Gothic is the Castle of Otranto, Otranto by Horace yeah. Walpole, which was written in the 18th century in which Jane Austen references and certainly George Ed Hare references. And you guys may not know, but um, before we sold Poison Pen Press, we agreed to, re to um, publish horror classics from the Haunted Library. Leslie Klinger, really? is, you know, a fabulous, yeah, we, the Library of Congress and the British Library Crime Classics, we're also doing horror crime classics. And Leslie Klinger, who is like, you know, the anthologist of, of all time, um, is working with the Horror Writers of America. It's their, it's their project. But one of the first books they republished was The Castle of Otrano. And I keep meaning to take a moment and actually reading it because it led to in, in England, the Castle of Otrano actually led to architecture. You know, I mean, it had a tremendous effect. Um, and again, it notice it's called the castle. 
right? Yeah. The castle of Otrano. So once again, we have, you know, the contained space, Containment. the castle, yeah. you know, not the house, whatever. Um, but I think it's male. And I, I'm just, you know, I need to reread it, but I don't think it always has to be a dead woman. Does, does anybody read The Fall of the House of Usher recently? There's another one. See, it's called The House of Usher. I mean, every time, you know, there's there's the stuff. Apparently we need to read it and come back and have a conversation about it. <laughs> well, that'll be our homework for next time, right? Homework. Now we'll include Isabel in our... In our um, right? Topic. Actually, Isabel, this all came about because people forever ask me, what's going to be, what's the next big thing? And two years ago, I said, the next big thing is going to be the Gothic. Mm -hmm. And so we've been, we've been discussing <laughs> that ever since. And, you know, I could hardly believe it when I read the Hacienda, I went, oh my God, here it is. You know, just like, wow, this is so wonderful. I mean, they're, they're, I think it's the best modern Gothic that I have read. Um, I mean, there are classics really great. As we've mentioned, but, and so I, I wrote to Jane Ann and JT and I said, got to read this. We're going to, we're going to talk about this. I was pretty sure that they would like it. Well, it means the pretty, world. And in fact, they have. Yeah. I love oh. it. Yeah. I mean, so we've been out, Jane and I have been out talking about this going, oh my God. I mean, Jane and I have a new new genre that's going to be coming up, but we're not going <laughs> to. Oh, yeah? I don't, I'm scared to ask. No, no, no don't, don't ask. ask. <laughs> don't ask. So, let, let let's me stick ask with the Gothic. There was, a, there was a new deal in Publishers Marketplace this week for another Gothic. For a, I, 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 Yeah, I'd have to pull it up. I'm, I was going to send it to you and be like, look, again, right. again, it's still... It's interesting well, the containment. I, I'm thinking about that now differently, right? I, it's I have become it's become a kind of critics buzzword kind of a thing, and frankly, it's not applied. Jane and I have talked about this. It's not it's not accurately applied to quite a few books. People get it confused with the lock room mystery, or you know, or the or the egg of the Christie country house murder, and it's you know, it's not that. It's different. But let me ask both of you, since Isabel has um, explained what what made her write it. Jane, what did you like about it? And then I'm going to ask JT, I've already told you what I liked about it. What did you like about it? I think I just fell in love with Isabel's voice. She probably could have told me any story and I would have, and I would have, I would have kept reading, but you have a marvelous sense of pacing, which in my reading experience, doesn't often marry well with a marvelous sense of description because people who are very, very good at description tend, this, for me, the books bogged down frequently. Mm -hmm. Yours didn't, not for a minute, because somehow the description was always tied to the character in a way that just kept me riveted to the page. So your basic storytelling voice is, that's your natural gift. And that's what made the book work for me. You just pick, you picked the right genre for me. <laughs> <laughs> but you brought the voice to it that it was just a perfect combination. Thank you so much. The plot and the pacing is something I definitely worked on quite hard because I think my early attempts at my earlier novels are usually quite front heavy and it took a while for the pacing to take off. And like you mentioned, I do like, I have always had, you know, you're a good writer because I have, uh, I enjoy writing description. It's something that brings me a lot of joy and it's something that I've become quite good at as a result. Um, but it definitely did bog me down. And I think, again, it was the short story writing. When you have to finish a story mm -hmm. in 4,000 words, you cut, you cut, you cut, you economize, you repurpose, you find a stronger way to say something. It was a really good boot camp. <laughs> so finally, when I was unleashed on the novel form yet again, I found that those habits stayed with me. But the pacing and like the plot itself, I studied screenwriting, um, like the Save the Cat writes the novel by Jessica Brody, the classic beat sheets, like I live and die by that beat sheet. And I remember my mom told me when she read an early draft of the Hacienda that to her, it felt like the most seamless thing of mine that she had read thus far. And I was like, that's amazing. If only you could see the spreadsheets because I thought there it would be so clunky because of all the scaffolding behind it. But for me, I know that doesn't work for all writers, but for me, 
I really had to teach myself how to do that pacing. And so it is just music to my ears, Jane, to hear you say that. I'm like, yes, I did it. I did it at last. You really pulled it up. Thank okay, you. JT, you're up. What did you I, like the best? I loved that Beatriz is not a doormat. In that she feels very modern. And I think that's why it translates so well, because she is, I mean, even when she's sitting at dinner at her uncle's house and he's bad mouthing her father and she is getting ready to jump in and defend her father, you know, that kind of spunkiness and that self-awareness that she's, she brings to this story of, yes, I am doing this for mercenary reasons. I am not marrying this man for love. And I think in Rebecca, I think our, our, our narrator never truly admits that she's doing something mercenary, even though we know she is. She's just trying to escape a bad situation, right? She's in love, in yeah. the kind of in love that you get when you, you know, see a meal ticket that's going to get you out of trouble. <laughs> but I don't think she really loves Max de Winter, do you? I mean, he's a means to an end. And I like that Beatrice is very clear, upfront, and, and when things start going south, she doesn't run and hide in the corner. And, and you know, she marches down and says, I need an exorcism. Okay. <laughs> you know, she's, she has agency in a way that our usual ingenue doesn't. And I don't know if that's a horror thing. Is that, is that I think part of the horror? Thing, honestly, <laughs> I think it's a me thing. Because when you read, when you think about like, the classic horror movie is the experience is the audience watching somebody do something that they really shouldn't. And you're like, no, 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 don't go into the basement or no, 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 don't go that way. Don't um, do the stupid thing that's going do to stupid thing. Don't hide behind the chainsaws. <laughs> really, you know, horror is such a broad genre. I think sometimes you find character, main characters who have quite a lot of agency, but I think there are very strong archetypes and very strong mm -hmm. patterns that writers fall into of having um, a character who lacks agency in some, or lacks self-awareness in some regard, because how else are you gonna get them into the horror situation? You know, they either have to be desperate or dumb or strung along enough to go into the haunted house for whatever reason and be trapped there. And so I think when it comes to like the specific house confinement, haunted house subgenre, or haunted space writ large, subgenre of horror, you have to keep them trapped in it for in some way, shape, or form. And so I think sometimes that a lack of agency kind of happens in the character, whether the author is intending it or not, depending on the writer's skill level. I found like sometimes the agency, lack of agency feels very purposeful and like it's really contributing to the atmosphere and the sense of claustrophobia. Like in Rebecca for me, it was oppressive how the main character seemed to lack agency or seemed to be unaware of the fact that she could step into her own agency, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's a horror thing. I think it's definitely a, a me thing in that I read Rebecca and I read The Haunting of Hill House and I, I felt this immense frustration because growing up in a world where women we're supposed to be very submissive. I grew up very rebellious and I lash out at that kind of expectation. And so when I saw, when I read these Gothic heroines who, who lack agency for one reason or another, whether it serves the plot or the atmosphere or what have you, I just, it kind of makes my blood boil a little bit. <laughs> And maybe this is just because I was projecting because I am a very passionate person. I am a very um, headstrong person, but I wanted to read a heroine. I wanted to read a book that had a heroine who stood up mm -hmm. to the madness, you know? Because I grew up in a world where if women were too emotional, too headstrong, too this, too that, they were crazy. And I had to stand up to it in one way or another. I couldn't do it then because I was like 13 and, and not in a position where I had agency, frankly, and on the page I could. So that's what I did. 
Well, that, so, that makes yes, me... the middle finger to, to the Catholic Church. <laughs> well, that makes me think that JT's earlier comment about um, the element of madness, mm -hmm. maybe it's particularly critical to this, not this kind of story because the heroine can't leave until she proves to herself she's not crazy. Right. Yeah. That she's, she's fighting to get her own sense of reality affirmed. I am not going mad. And if she walks away from the situation, escapes the situation, she'll always wonder. She would yeah. never know. That's well, really and that also is the, the dissonance of the modern, because the modern versus the historical Gothic, because that whole idea of the madness I mean, in the modern one, people aren't going to be patting you on the head and saying, oh, sweetheart, it's all fine. You know, it, it's just it's just a different, yeah. we live in a different world now. You know, What's they the aren't going to just say? call you a hysterical female and, and you know, like they used to. I mean, hysteria I mean, hasn't really been a diagnosis in a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think in the modern world there's more of a clinical approach to the to mm -hmm. the madness. And so yeah. would the madness be the capital M madness that we need it to be for this genre? No. That's that's a really uh, that is a wonderful. Next well, I have to admit that I, you know, as I started out, I really worried that Beatrice was going to be more like Mrs. De Winter. Um, and I was pleased to see that she went. But before we call Patrick up, let me comment on one other thing that I truly love besides all of the things we have talked about. And maybe your short story training, Isabel, helped you do this. But there are some really brilliant other characters we have not mentioned. <laughs> I fell in love with Isabel's dead father, even though he's never alive in the book. But you really had to admire him. You had to love him for his wonderful qualities and you can see why Beatrice you know was shaped by that I thought her bitchy aunt uh was incredibly well done yeah, you know, one of horrible woman there but <laughs> really <laughs> emphasizes you know the colonial <laughs> thing as you was. say and the and the racial thing which is very modern you know that that part of it mm -hmm. I thought the senior priest was really well done. And we've hardly even mentioned Rodolfo's sister, Juana, who, um, and the housekeeper. Um, and so I, I think all the characters are very vivid. Would mm -hmm. you agree with that? Even if they're, you know, just only on the page a little bit, that Beatrice and, um, you know, they don't totally dominate the book, that everybody has a voice and everybody is very much alive and has a, a role to play. Um, and so I thought it was very well balanced. Mm -hmm. There's no wasteful characters. There's no, there's no waste in this at all. Actually. Right. And I think that's a real gift is about to be able to just give a, a little space to a character, but have that character be so vivid. Um, so I thought you did that extremely well. So let me call Patrick up and see if he has questions or comments or whatever it is um, that he wants to bring us from the audience. Hello. Yes, I do, actually. Um, there are a couple of good ones that have come in. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, let's see. Somebody would, is asking about um, if you do research into the supernatural you know, for your books, um, have you had the experience where that that research makes you more receptive to the supernatural in your daily life? I think my research was done in timeouts on the bottom of the basement stairs and that my little <laughs> sister and I have theories that she was also a, a frequent flyer on had frequent flyer miles for the basement stairs and the bas the basement furnace <laughs> for timeouts. We were both very naughty children but ooh, my take on the supernatural in this book um there are two veins of it one broad vein of it is the magic that padre andreas practices and that was majority fictional i drew that from my noggin um there are some aspects of uh folklore and um, woven into his practice as the heir to his grandmother's um, position as community leader and which on Hacienda San Isidro, 
uh, but his the witchcraft, especially that he battles with throughout the book that he's afraid of, that is inherited from the European side of his family was made up. But when it com comes to the question of supernatural as in the ghosts, um, I did have one really interesting conversation with a cousin of mine whose story is her own, but the bare bones of it is, as uh, she moved to a historic city, a, a city here in the US um, that she was new to, and she moved into a building that unbeknownst to her was on actually a city ghost tour. It was a frequent stop on the city ghost tour. And so you can imagine what kind of vibes this place had. And she spent, I think part of lockdown there and it was, um, really interesting and so she and I had a long talk and I embroidered scenes where Beatrice deals with like when she walks into the north wing or there's the cold or weight on her chest those are all details um that sensory details that um I used that I learned in that conversation when it comes to like do I google like what are ghosts like no I'm too much of a wuss like honestly I scare myself so easily. And I scared myself frequently while writing this book. Uh, there was one point in time when I was writing it when my husband was, was out of town on a business trip before the pandemic and I slept with the lights on. <laughs> so. And they're done think, that. <laughs> yeah, and they're done that. It's, I have a very active imagination. It's great because it's become my job, but also sometimes I am its victim. So yes and no, I guess is my short question. <laughs> my short answer to this question. How about the two of you? Have you dealt much with the supernatural and has your take on it changed over time? Not so much. <laughs> Jane shaking her head. So I, I have, I, I, I have several ghost stories. I keep bumping into ghosts. I actually wear um, a citrine for protection because I, I have a tendency to invite that in if I'm not careful and I, I have to really I scare myself as well and and I write some creepy stuff and it freaks me out so I have to be balanced boundaries I try yes, you have to have boundaries. the boundaries well, I, I haven't been able to read this at night I've only been able to I, yeah the second it starts getting dark out I've had to put this down I'm sorry I'm not it's, sorry <laughs> it's not scary like that it's just this level of dread that just, you know, makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up in a good way, <laughs> in a good way. But we've yeah, had, we've, we've asked, you know, a number of authors about, um, you know, either houses or places in which, you know, violence has occurred, you know, maybe if you're talking about battlefields or, you okay. know, um, things like that. Um, there's a question that's kind of coming around to that. Do you believe that that places like that uh, contain some sort of residue uh, or just a vibe? I do. I do. <laughs> I to believe that. Absolutely. I, I, I can go with that one for sure. Yeah. yeah. And I think something terrible and traumatic and tragic as the scale, like to the scale of like a battle or a murder, that's not a, like, that doesn't have to be it. I think sometimes the more mundane violences of family life can leave vibes in a place, you know, like houses see everything. And I think that that's my little theory <laughs> that I put into Andres's mouth for him to say to readers. But I think houses really do, there's some houses, like, I, I don't know, but like not all, but some houses just have, I, I think residue is a great word actually, Patrick, but just have like um, a vibe to them or a, a feeling or a taste where it's like someone very unhappy lived here or was here for a very long time. And it just kind of got sticky on the walls or it just kind of lingers in a way that we can't really explain. It doesn't make sense. And no matter, no matter how often you like open the windows and try and air it out, it, it just doesn't go away. Well, so. if you live, if you live in an old house to like a historic house, um, oh, nice. yeah, I mean, like I, I, my, mine was built in 1926 and we got the full deed so I can see how many people have lived in it. And there's a bunch, you know, so and, uh, and you just, 
every once in a while when you're when you're going in the crawl space you'll find a toy or something you know and it's uh Creepy. Well, you just I had a really interesting experience years ago when I was in England. I lived in England for a while in 1986. I was in Lancaster, which was a famous witch's trial location. Mm -hmm. And they gave you the opportunity, if you were brave enough, to let yourself be locked into the dungeon in Lancashire <laughs> Castle that the witches were locked into. Oh, God. And oh, God. And I, I agreed to do it. And I have to tell you, it was absolutely terrifying. Part of it was the history, part of it was the weight of the castle, part of it was, but you know, the thing that was absolutely the worst of it is that there, the light, there is zero light. It is in the bowels of the castle. And when they close that door and they only leave you there for a few minutes because they're scared that, you know, you won't survive it. I'm telling you, it is Stygian darkness and you can't orient yourself because you can't see your hand you can't see any part of yourself or any part of the surroundings so all your sensory stuff is blocked and you know and you stand there and and i can you could see from that why these poor women who were locked up there went crazy and why you know they even agreed to be witches it was okay. so horrible um and i've always been glad afterward <laughs> afterward that i did it because it was the closest I've ever come to figuring out how you would feel, you know, if you were in San Isidro when it was. The other thing that we didn't mention is, and we won't go into the finale here, but one of the questions I think you have to ask in the Gothic is, is it essential that the house that has been the containment factor is destroyed? It is the fall of the House of Usher. Manderley burns down, right? Yeah. That's it, right? Because when the house burns... That's it. And I often, you know, is that an essential part of this kind of a story? Um, I think it's an interesting question. That is an interesting question. Well, also, is the house? The house, which isn't proper gothic, it's more horror. But in The Haunting of Hill House, you know, the protagonist dies trying to leave, I think, in like a car crash. And the house continues. So mm -hmm. the house won. So... <laughs> Perhaps in order for the protagonist to win, the house must be destroyed. There are some. Well, that was my question. You know, I yeah. mean, is that part of the, you know, liberation or whatever survival of the character? I don't know. I mean, I think it's such a fluid genre. You could do almost anything with it. I don't think there's any, you know, actual stamp. Although there's you some, did, you did identify key that. ingredients, but I think it's a genre that lets you really um, play around with things. Yeah. Don't totally. you? I was just going to say that there there are some cases where the house is almost like a portal. It's or it's above a portal into something that's much e more evil. And so in that case, the house does have to be destroyed. Or know? it could be like the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It could be like Narnia, where that the house is actually a portal to something wonderful. Something good, yeah. <laughs> that's funny, Patrick. Laura Benedict's uh, Bliss House has that. It's as you drill down in the house, the evil is below it. Yeah, it's Mexican mm. Gothic is like that too. Yeah, it has more yeah. of a sci-fi twist to it, but going down like the evil is below. Stuart Neville's last book, uh, you know, completely atypical for him was very much like that. Yeah. Really? Yeah, great book, terrific, creepy as hell. Um, let's see. Any <laughs> other questions? Yeah, I do have a few more. Um, let's see, Arlene. Uh, has a couple of writerly questions. She said, well, she says, uh, when or how do you know uh, how to escalate, sorry, let me start over. When or how do you know to escalate the tension in your storytelling? Is it through your plotting or does it just organically happen? I think it's a mix of both. I, I said earlier, I work with beat sheets. And so I follow, because I want to write books that are quite commercial, that is just what I enjoy reading and writing. I follow uh, the classic three act structure. And so with, I like to think of the way I drafted um, the Hacienda as running between goalposts in the dark. So what the beat sheet does is it lays out like firm goalposts, like little, like a relay, like a relay race or something like little posts in, like that you can follow through the darkness where it's like, and now the tension must escalate 
because we're at the midpoint, something really large has to shift or we're at the 75% point. Like at that point in the Marvel movie, something's gonna go to hell. The villains are closing in 80%. The mentor is probably gonna die. Like that's there are classic storytelling structures that we internalize as readers and consumers of media that follows that three act structure as many movies do. Um, so I think it is a mix of instinct and clinging desperately to goalposts in the dark because what else do I have to follow? <laughs> because I think knowing, especially in the latter half of the book where pacing can sometimes get too fast in my experience when I'm writing books, I can sometimes move too quickly through the ending. Having those beat sheets um, as goalposts where I think like, okay, I need to spend at least 3000 words in this section. I can do that. Like I can drill down and do that before moving on. So it's a combination really of instinct, but there's sometimes where, like, for example, I look at my old books that I wrote before I became familiar with the Save the Cat um, Kool-Aid and then drank it wholesale um where the beats are there and if you so I instinctively was putting them in a bit albeit a bit clumsily so I operate on a mix of got my beat sheet I've got my my map so to speak and then relying on instinct to carry me from goalpost to goalpost JT what do you think yeah um so I'm a uh... I had written five books before I even knew there was something called the hero's journey. Um, so I, mine was definitely instinctual. Um, the minute I learned that, I think it's been much harder on me because then I am trying to think about this. I write in a five act structure. I don't like the three act. I think it's too, it's too confining for me. I can get bogged down in the middle. So I do mine in, in five acts. And that has worked really, really well as far as pacing is concerned and everything. But I don't like to plan things out. I, I'm, I, you know, I might have. I call them turnings. I might. You, you're calling them sign goalpost. I'm, yeah. I, I call them turnings. I might have an idea of what two or three of those are when I start, but I will find them as I start really getting into it. And when I have about fifty thousand words, that's when I can start seeing what the story might be. And then I can start looking at the beats, mm -hmm. but I can't do it until I've got a whole chunk of work done, and which is- about you, Jane? I'm all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have been known to write the ending just to see what I have to do to get there. That's so Sometimes. interesting. That's I don't have a- I, yeah. You know, I figure if I'm getting bored, the reader's gonna get bored. And that's <laughs> kind of how I do it. Really good rule of thumb in my experience. Yeah, the best actually. <laughs> I'm bored. Like, like, I don't want to write this scene. Then we gotta it. we gotta reevaluate here, yep. guys. <laughs> yep. If you if you're reluctant to approach something, skip it. Your reader will hate it too. I mean, Amen. throw it out. Good point, Patrick. Anything else? Yeah, maybe a final question. Um, let's see. There there are a few kind of questions about you know. Why do you think it is that we that we there's something in us that likes to be scared or that or that needs that experience of being scared in some ways? Um, as writers, do you ever find yourself um, uh, holding back as far as going down into your own personal nightmare land, you know, or whatever it is that really, really scares you? Um, those are two separate questions, but. That's a great question. Jane, what do you think? I, there's certain things I won't read. Um, and it's, it's part of its fear, I guess. I, I will not do serial killer stories in which there's a lot of graphic, cut them up on the page. I just don't like torture. I won't read torture. If you're going to kill off somebody, do it fast. <laughs> I'm fine with that, but I can't read torture. But what does that mean? I mean, that's just, to me, that's the ultimate evil, and I can't, I don't want to do that. I don't, I, it wouldn't be a story that I would find fun to read, I guess is what I'm saying. So I, I do have some limits. I think we all have limits. I mean, I don't limit, 
I, I will, I will go absolutely all the way. Mine as deep as I can to tell a story, um, for sure. But the, the being scared though, haven't there been a, a bunch of recent studies about the physiological part of that, that as you know, cavemen, we, we were on a constant high end danger alert and now that we are such comfortable creatures that, you know, the worst that we have to do is sit on our couch and that's how we have to get our danger, that it's, it's satisfying a physiological need, an actual biological thing that has been programmed into us from you know, the very beginning. It's a survival instinct. Exactly. And so since we don't have to survive our daily lives, that we seek that out to, you know, there, but for the grace of God, go I, oh my goodness, you know, we're not likely we to get eaten by a bear. Crime? Yeah. So it's yeah. A, safe, a safe adrenaline rush. It is. It's a safe adrenaline rush. Exactly. And there's something very powerful and binding about fear. Cause no matter what you're afraid of, whether it's serial killers or ghosts or something more um, monstrous or whatever that is. Fighters. Fear is so universal. And I think when we read horror, it does, it might, maybe it does trigger that physiological need that you were talking about, JT, that makes a lot of sense to me. But also I think it can be very comforting because no matter what you're reading and like whether or not it speaks to your direct experience or many readers will come to my book who are not raised Catholic or who were not Mexican or Mexican American, but will see their own fears reflected on the page. And I think we find comfort in that, weirdly mm -hmm. enough, even the though universality it's mm -hmm. the universality is very powerful and fear yeah. being such a base emotion appeals to so many people. So I don't know why people seek it maybe it's that physiological thing, but I know when they find it, I think they can take comfort in the fact that they're not alone. No matter what they fear, if they see it on the page, they know someone else is afraid of this too. You know, I'm not alone in that. Someone else believes that houses have, you know, bad vibes yeah. <laughs> and they can take comfort in that and feel community in that, which also satisfies a really powerful physiological need, I think. Absolutely. Well, I think there can be catharsis in it. And I go back to an amazing conversation I had with P.D. James in 1995, which was, in fact, the very first virtual event we ever did. Um, and I still remember her saying that, you know, because she wrote some really scary stuff. I mean, you know, she is not a British cozy writer by any means. And I remember her saying, you know, that it was what a comfort it was to lie in bed and recognize that the footstep on the stairs was not coming for you. You were reading it, you know, but, but you were safe in your bed and there you were reading about this awful thing, but you knew that the footstep on the stair was not coming for you. And I've always thought that kind of summed it up. I love um, that. I've, My I've, mom I've always me. loved that. And I think about that a lot when I'm reading a book, such as your wonderful book, Isabel. I'm so glad that we had an opportunity, all of us, to come together. JT and Jane, thank you so much for doing a fast dive into this book and taking out an hour tonight to talk to us. Isabel, it's really been a terrific pleasure. For those of you watching, honestly, the Hacienda, you know, you may think that you don't want to read historical fiction, you don't want to be scared, you don't want to, but honestly, it is such a fabulous combination of things. It's a reading experience that you will not find, I think, anywhere else. So I can't recommend it highly well, enough. Did you Thank have you all for in joining us this evening. Good night, everybody. Good night. Great Good to night. meet you. Oh. Congratulations, Isabel. Thank you, all. Thank you all. This was delightful. Indeed. And I forgot I had my glass of wine all the way through to toast you <laughs> and I blew it. Cheers. <laughs> so a toast to you, Isabel, and congratulations so on much. a wonderful debut. Thank All right. You. Bye, everybody. Good night. Bye. Bye.